Good morning again. You know, from the very beginning of creation, God has established the need for leadership. Even in the very first marriage between Adam and Eve, God established Adam as the leader. In the Bible, we have the patriarchs whose leadership influenced not just a family, but entire tribes of people. There were prophets and priests, kings, judges. Uh, God is always working His will through spiritual leaders. Now, when you come to the New Testament, we find the greatest leader of all, Jesus Christ. And the very first thing that we see Him begin to do is the process of training leaders. And those leaders then reproduce themselves. And down through the centuries, we, we have this process being carried on and, and, and up to, to today. And, and the goal, even today, is to make disciples, which is the process of training new leaders. Now, did you know that the primary purpose of the family is to be a training ground for raise, the raising up of godly men and women. Proverbs 22.6, you know, I would be um, drummed out of preaching if, if you didn't bring this scripture up today. Train up the child in the way they should go. This is the very heart of, of God's purpose for the family. Now, in the text that we're going to be looking at today, which is in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, Paul identifies himself in two different ways as a leader. In verse 11, he says, We were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you. That's some good thunder. Uh, encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children. And then in verse 7, he says, We prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. So Paul gives us a picture of a spiritual leader in, in a mothering way and also the spiritual leader in, as a father. And the balance of these two is essential for effective parenting and, and in spiritual leadership. Now, it's interesting that in verses 7 through 9 in, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says twice that the goal is to proclaim the gospel of God, God's good news. So we need to understand that the first priority and a major part of parenting is to provide a nurturing environment for children's souls so that they, they have the security and the peace and the affection and the kindness and the gentleness and the mercy and the love, all of those things that are necessary so that the gospel message can be taught and modeled and preached within the home and that the children are able to hear it and receive it. And there's a maternal side to, to that and there is a paternal side to that. So this being Father's Day, obviously I want to focus on the, the role of fathers in spiritual development. Now before we get into that, we need to kind of understand what makes a man a man. Apparently, in our society today, people are confused about that. And, and so I think it's important for us to understand what makes a man a man. Now, if I were to, to ask random people, we would get all kinds of, of different ideas, uh, different answers. So let's focus in. Now, with, with that understanding, the, the church in Corinth... If you remember from, from your Bible readings, the church in Corinth was a mess as a church. It, was, it had a lot of problems. 
They were weak. They were sinful. They were worldly. They were compromising. They just, they had a lot of problems in the church. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, Paul, Paul says this to them. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Act like men. So how do men act? Well, it's interesting that in that command to act like men, he says, be strong. And to be strong means to conduct yourself in a courageous way. So if you want to know how men act, one of the things that we are to do is we are to have courage. We are to have strength. And if you put those two words together, courage and strength, you get the word fortitude. Fortitude is courage and strength. And that's how men are to act. The desire, the will to, to challenge, to attack the, the difficult. Men are designed to be out on the edge. Now, today we live in a risk-free culture. You know, we're, we're not too worried about having to go out and hunt down our food or fend off attacks from the enemies and, and things like that. And so as a result, many men today struggle with understanding their, their purpose, understanding their identity, understanding who they're supposed to be. You know, there, there's something in a, in a man that needs to be challenged that needs to compete, that needs to accomplish. If you look at the greatest leaders down through history, they were men who were willing to take, take risk if necessary, who were willing to exhibit strength and courage in the, in the face of adversity. Now, Paul says, act like men, be courageous, be strong, take a stand, conduct yourself in a courageous way. But notice the next verse, verse 14, he says, let all you do be done in love. We can't forget that aspect. So men are to act with courage and strength. We're not supposed to be wishy-washy. We are to face life with courage. Now, this, this phrasing in 1 Corinthians 16 has a lot of parallels in the Old Testament. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go after all of them, but I want to pull two or three of them out just so that we kind of get the, the balance or we get the understanding. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses is about to, to die. And he is turning over control of leading the children of Israel to Joshua. And in verse 6, this is what Moses says. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Then Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, Be strong and courageous. So we, we are to act, This you know, men are to act with strength and courage. You jump down to verse 23 in that very same chapter. Then he commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous. Now over in 1 Kings chapter 2, David is also about to die. And he is turning the reins over to his son Solomon. And if you were a dad and you knew you were about to pass from this life, and you had one last visit with your son, what would you say to that child? What would you, what would you want to communicate? Well, this is what David says to Solomon. I am going the way of all of the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. We are to be strong. We are to be courageous. God has designed us that way. In 1 Chronicles 22, again, we have a conversation where David is speaking to Solomon. And beginning with verse 11, he says, Now, my son, the Lord be with you that you may be successful and build the house of the Lord your God, just as he has spoken concerning you. 
Verse 12, only the Lord give you discretion and understanding and put you in charge of Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you are careful to follow the statutes and the ordinances which the Lord commanded Moses concerning Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed. So David is saying, you're going to be the leader of Israel and you're going to have all kinds of opposition. You're going to run into all kinds of challenges and problems. You want to make sure that you are living for God, that you are being observant of the, the commands of God, that you are doing what is right. When you get attacked, don't waver, be strong, be courageous. That's what godly men are supposed to do. We are to be strong in our faith, strong in the things of God, resolute in our understanding and in, in the, the discretion and in, in the wisdom and, and in the ways of God so that when the challenges come, we know how to stand and we, we stand resoutly so that, that there's not, oh, I don't know what to do in this situation. We, we don't find, we don't put ourselves in, in that type of situation. It is our responsibility as Christian fathers to lead by example of being a strong, courageous, godly man. You do that by having the courage of your conviction you know, and that's David's message to his son. Be a man, be strong, be courageous. Don't be afraid to do what is right. Don't be afraid to stand with God. Know what the scriptures have told you and do what you're supposed to do. So how? How, how do we have that kind of, of gut strength to do what's right? Um, we're going to look at one little last section here in Joshua. Now, again, God has you know, told Moses, you're going to die. Moses is now gone. He's out of the way. Joshua is now the leader of the Israelites, and he is about to take the children of Israel across the river and to take the land that God has promised. In Joshua chapter 1, God's word to Joshua Chapter in verse six, be strong and courageous. Verse seven, only be strong and very courageous. Verse nine, don't do not tremble, do not be dismayed. And and so, on what basis do we have the fortitude to deal with these hardships, to to step up to the problems that that are going to confront? Well, the answers are found within this text here. In verse 5 of Joshua chapter 1, God says at the end of verse 5, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. So the first thing that we need to understand is that when we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, when we are, are trying to lead our homes, when we are trying to lead our lives, we're trying to lead our business life, you know, when, we're, when we are trying to be a godly leader, the first thing we need to understand is that God is going to be with us as we do that. That being a spiritual leader is understanding that God's presence is going to be going with you. God says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. The second thing in verse 6, it says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Here's the thing. If what we are doing is what God wants us to be doing, like being godly parents, being godly businessmen, being godly husbands, being a godly person. If we are doing what we know we're supposed to be doing, then we can rest on the fact that God has ordained it and God will sustain it and God will give us the strength necessary to carry it out. Because the battle belongs to God. 
Then the, fir- the third thing in verse 7, he says, Be careful to do um, according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded. Don't turn to the right or the left, and you'll have success. And then verse 8, the book of the law, the Holy Scripture, don't let, your, your, um, don't let it depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do all according uh, that is written in it, and you will make your way prosperous, prosperous and you will have success. What this is telling us is if we are living lives that are honoring God, if we are living lives that are focused on God, if we are seeking to be obedient to the will and the word of God, then we will have the power of sovereign God behind us. He will move us in the direction that we need to go. He will help us. He is guaranteeing that we will be successful. Now, our courage, in essence, is braced by the the reality that we know that we have the presence of God and that when we live according to the word of God, we can know that our, our cause will be just, it will be successful, and that we have the promise of God's sovereign power being made available in our lives. Now, the question, you know, the the reality is, if we are living this way, as we have looked at in, in recent messages, that is going to put us in conflict with the world. People are going to respond negatively when we take a stand for Christ and when we lead our family to take a stand for Christ. And so isn't that going to cause problems? Isn't that do we need to worry about that? And I would say no, not at all. We need to ask ourselves, is what I'm doing right in God's eyes, in God's sight? Is the cause just? Do I have the promise of God for what I'm doing? Because if it's consistent with his word, if I have the promise of God with me, then what matters is not whether it makes other men happy or unhappy. What matters is, does it bring honor and glory to God? I want, to be, I want to impress God with my life. I don't need to impress people. And, and that needs to be our mindset. So if you want to raise a child who is, is a strong, godly person, then you have to be a strong, godly leader. That's true as fathers, and, and it's true in any type of, of spiritual leadership. If you live boldly by the word of God without compromise, if you resist the pressure of not taking the easy way, if you resist the temptation to try to please people, and if instead you live to please God, and if you don't sell out your integrity, then you will fulfill the fatherly role as as it's being put, put to us here. So in 1 Thessalonians 2, Verse 11, Paul says, I came to you as a father to his own children. And then at verse 10, just before that, he tells them, he reminds them, you you were my witnesses. You saw what I did. And then again in 11, he says, I'm calling on your your own first-handed knowledge. You were you were observant. You were witnesses to the way I acted, the way I, I conducted myself. And God was a witness to it as well. So, you know, and God knows how how devoutly, how uprightly, how blamelessly I behaved towards you. That's a father's responsibility. A a father needs to be seen in a way that is blameless, in in a way that shows integrity, in, in a way that is upright. Now, verses 10, 11, and 12, he says, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly and rightly and blamelessly we behave towards you. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children. 
so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What Paul is saying is, I did my duty to God devoutly. And from the perspective of my relationship to God, I was devout. From the perspective of my relationship to to fulfilling the word of God, doing what I know the Bible wants me to do, he says, I was upright. And from the perspective of how I interacted with people, I was blameless. So this is, this is our responsibility. This is, this is what being a spiritual father looks like. This is, this is how men are supposed to behave. You set a pattern that is an uncompromising life, consumed by what is right and and aware in the presence of God. Uh, And you you trust God for his unfailing sovereignty to guide you and lead you and protect you and move you forward. Fathering starts with modeling this life of virtue. Now, verse 11 takes it a step even further. It's not just modeling this, but it's also teaching it. In verse 11, he says, Just as you knew how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring. Well, exhorting has has this mindset of... um, Well, let me... Just a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. What God has done is he wants fathers to, in essence, this is a rainy day. And, you know, think of an umbrella. The the father is to set this umbrella over his life of godly behavior that I've been describing. And then he brings his wife in under that umbrella. And the idea there is that the two of them then have children. And there is this this network, if you will, or there is this plan in place. There is this pattern where this godly behavior is not only modeled, but it's also taught and and it's lived out in in this unit that we call a family. Now, the word exhorting here is is the idea of to move someone in a specific direction. A father comes along his, beside his child and he guides that child in a specific direction. It's, it's personal. It, it's personal instruction. But they not only exhort them, but they're also encouraging them. Encouraging means to motivate. And from a father's role, sometimes that motivation is giving them a positive word and and saying, hey, this is what we need to do. Come on. And, and, And they're like a cheerleader. Sometimes that exhorting becomes, come on, let's get moving. This is the way we got to do things. You know, this is what is necessary. A father's role is to help that child Move in the right direction. And then there's a third thing that we are to implore, which means to continually guide. This is where a a father comes along and says, hey, listen, I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know you want to quit. I know you want to take the easy way, but you can't because taking the easy way or, or not doing what you know is right is going to actually be more trouble and it'll cause you greater harm than than anything else. And so learn from my mistakes or or you know don't don't take the the easy path. Do what is right in God's eyes. This you can do this. You know that, that's that's the role of the father. It's, it's setting the standard of what is expected behavior. And the idea that if you don't meet this expected behavior, there's consequences. This, this is how it has to be. 
And why does this all happen this way? Verse 12, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. When you become a follower of Christ, there is a new father. You are, you are adopted into the, the family of God. And your father has this standard. And so as, as earthly parents, we communicate to our children, this is the standard. This is the expectation. This is what's done because you are a part of the family of God. And because of that, you want to live up to this standard. You want to be this kind of person. That's, that's what spiritual parenting looks like. And again, there is a balance to it. There is a tender mothering side. And there, there is the strong, encouraging, fatherly side. But there is a balance. You know, the mother offers the tender side, the love side, the nurturing, the caring. And the father is supposed to be the one who exhorts to the life uh, that God requires. It is a balance, but it is a beautiful balance. This is what spiritual parenting is supposed to be like. It's not enough just to be tender and loving and compassionate. There has to be an uncompromising standard, an uncompromising boundary that, that is put in place. The, and when we, when we have this working correctly, then God is honored because godly young people grow up in that environment. They thrive in that environment. And then one day they become parents and, and the process continues to be repeated over and over again. Now, I have to admit, and I, I wish I had better understood this when I was raising my own children. You know, I, I ashamedly confess that this does not describe the way I was as a father. And um, I didn't want to preach this message today, to be quite honest. I told Cindy, I, I hope I have a catastrophic heart attack so I, I don't have to preach. Because this doesn't describe the way I was or, you know, a, a, as a dad. And, and many of you may be sitting here going, well, my chance is gone. My kids are grown. They're out of the home. But the reality is, is we never know what God's plans are ultimately. And we will find ourselves possibly being in the role of a parent um, it, when we weren't expecting to. Maybe it will be a neighbor child. Maybe it'll be a grandchild or a great grandchild. Our responsibility is to be obedient to God. And if you'll remember 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. If you, like me, realize what I have just preached about didn't describe you, doesn't describe you, the place to begin is to come before God and say, God, I'm sorry that I, I fell short. Help me to not do that anymore. And then you get into the Word and you study the Word because it is through the Word of God that the Holy Spirit will produce new balance and, and new, new life in you. Let God come to you and change you so that you can be transformed into the person God wants you to be. Again, you don't know where God will use you down the road. But I, I just want you to understand that even if your kids are grown, all is not lost. Pray for them and pray for your own change of heart so that God can use you as, as completely as possible. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being the perfect father. With you, we don't have to find an apology or to be ashamed. With you, we see perfection. And we see love. 
and we see everything that, that needs to be there. So, Father, I just pray. I pray for everybody in the hearing of this message today. I pray that you will change in us our, our view and that we will, we will become the people you want us to be. That we won't be settling with status quo. Oh, it's good enough. Help us, Father, to want you more than anything else on the face of this earth. Help us to, to want you at all costs. And I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.